Welcome to part five of the IPAMS USA series. This is the final part, and uh, thank you for coming along this far. This is Ryan Womack. I'm data librarian at Rutgers University Libraries. If you missed the earlier segments, they are available via the playlist, via this YouTube channel. Um, but in this section, we are going to dive into R and use the IPAMS R package to uh, actually use our data extract downloaded from IPAMS USA. So let's just quickly review how we got to this point. We went to the IPAMS USA site. We uh, are looking for that long range of census and American community survey data. Uh, we used our account uh, to log in, to go to select data, to select a series of individual level data for the years 1870, 1920, 1970, and 2019, which is the latest year available. We went, once we had made those selections via this interface, we went to My Data and waited for our extract to generate. And so you can see my recent attempts at extract generation here. Um, for this session, I'm gonna zoom in on the one that I used uh, extract number six on the screen here, the one that is in the DAT data format. Um, I've also played around with the CSV format. CSV is usually something that I would prefer to use, but in the case of IPAMS, I would recommend sticking with their default recommendation, which is .DAT, because all of the command files and the codebook that comes with it are configured by default to use that. It works very smoothly. You can import your data into, into R easily with that and then do something else with it. So uh, it, it is also possible to work with CSV. I just found that it introduced some unnecessary complication. So to what do you need to download for your project to be usable? You need to download the data file that's in green. Just use your right click on your browser uh, to save any of these items. That's typically what will work for your system. Um, you can right click on the code file that you're going to use and we're going to use R. So I, I grab the R file. If you were using other statistical software, SPSS, SAS, or Stata, those code files are there as well. Uh, and you need the DDI codebook. Um, it's not like maybe immediately obvious here, but grab the DDI codebook uh, because that's gonna help you set up your data with all the correct labels. It's just a very nice process once you have that. I would recommend grabbing the basic codebook as well. You don't technically need that, but it's nice to have just as a reference. That's a plain text version of the codebook. So uh, we'll leave this IPAMS window open because at, we, we, we will be looking at some references to uh, data descriptions and things a little bit later. And I've already downloaded these files. Uh, if you're trying to follow along with your own data extract, go ahead and download those files. Uh, go on over to my GitHub site, uh, the GitHub directory, github.com slash ryandata slash IPAMS, I-P-U-M-S. Um, same as linked in the video below. And you'll see the code files that I will be using. Now, the one thing that's missing here is the, the large data file itself. GitHub has a file size limit. So use your own data extract if you want real big data. Um, I'll point out later uh, as we run through the code, there are some smaller sample extracts. I took a, si a, a 100,000 person extract of the extract that I had, had pulled down in case uh, you know you just need to grab a quick small file to play around with those are here in this directory but those are not the ones I'm going to be actually using for the demo uh, while we're here um, I'm going to click on the code book the text code book that ends in .cbk just to show you that this is a plain text description of the data um, and so it's, you know, something very basic format that's always available. You, you could use this in the future with, um, if you're trying to adapt the data to other software, other contact, 
other contexts, etc. The XML file is the DDI file. And we'll talk a little bit briefly about what is DDI. But that is our uh, sort of key to unlocking the data set. And the .r file is the code file that we will be working through. So another thing I found, I was trying to rename the uh, files into a simpler uh, format. And I found that once I renamed a file, um, you know, there's there's numerous places throughout the XML and, and things where the, the file name is automatically inserted. And I sort of quickly got into a, a situation where I was generating some errors by changing the file name. And I said, you know what, it's not worth it. Uh, to do that, let me just leave the name that IPMS gave these files, which is just computer generated based on the number of abstract extract that you've pulled. Um, and everything works fine if you just leave the defaults, leave it alone. So that's the reason it says USA underscore 00003 um, for these files. All right. so. I've cloned this repository. You can clone it. You can download the zip file of all these files and just put it on your computer. And then you'll be ready to actually get into R and do, do the work. So I'm going into R Studio right now. And I have navigated to the directory where I've put these files. And you'll notice one more file that's here that's not on GitHub again because it's too large is this 138 megabyte uh, zip file of my raw data. So that's over the file size limit on GitHub. But this is what it would look like if, if when you download your material from um, IPMS directly, just put it in a directory and drop it all in there so that it looks something like this and you should be good to go. All right, so I'm going to click on the .r file and open it up in our RStudio environment. Um, so I prefer this black background for my RStudio. Um, that's just a preference you can you can change in RStudio. So that's really the only difference if you're comparing why does this RStudio not have a white background. That's what's going on there. Um, we are going to use the IPMS uh, the I, IPMS R package for our work. So if you haven't installed that, you're going to need to install it on line 10. And there's a summary in the comments here of what we just talked through of which files you need to download. The DAT file comes in a zipped format, but you don't have to worry about unzipping it. The IPMS R package will, will do that for you when you import the data. Okay, so now the original form of this .r file that was given, written by, uh, computer generated by IPMS is the, the segment between the sort of long uh, hashtag uh, symbols there. Very brief. Um, it reminds you that you need to download both the data and the DDI file. Uh, it's got one line that um, checks for the presence of IPMS R on your system and if not, warns you that you need to install it. So I'm running line 26, it's loaded that package. Uh, very important, you need to import the DDI file first. So the, the IPMS R package will, will take a step in a moment to look a little bit more at that, but it has many read functions that help you accomplish different tasks. Now for this kind of IPMS USA micro data, we're going to want to read the data in using read IPMS micro. Before we do that, we want to read the DDI file associated with it with read IPMS DDI. That's on line 28. So I just put the XML file's name in there and I say, let's read that. Um, actually, yeah, so I have forgotten to change my working directory to my current working directory. So that would be good to do. Um, let me do that right now so that it will find my files. Okay. 
that should be correct. All right, so now I've, I've set my directory correctly. Uh, line 28 should work. Yes, all right, so uh, command executed. And as we know, um, if we look up in the environment, we can see what has happened, right? An object called DDI has been created in the R workspace. Now we're ready to take those instructions um, from the DDI file and use them to load the data itself. Now I'm just going to keep it simple. I'm going to follow um, the the this is this is the exact uh, text that came from IPMs to me. So I'm just saying data is read IPMs micro in parentheses DDI. So now you can see we've got a warning from IPMs reminding us use the data um, correctly, cite the data appropriately. And it thinks for a moment um, and actually process that relatively quickly on my desktop here. Uh, this is 8,730,000 observations, um, which it has processed. So we now have our data file. This is the, you know, the big event has already happened here. We've imported our data. Notice how easy it was. It's just two steps. As long as you just follow the, the steps in the correct order, this is a fantastic package for that purpose, right? You don't have to muck around with a very large data file with, with variables that have lots of labels and codes, which we're going to get into in a second. The DDI file handles all that for us beautifully. So, so this is just wonderful. Okay, I said I would say a little bit about DDI. I keep saying DDI. What is DDI if you're not familiar with it? DDI is the Data Documentation Initiative, uh, is what the acronym stands for. And that initiative uh, has defined a standard for uh, essentially social science metadata and codebook descriptions and ways to format data. I said prime it originated out of the social sciences. You'll find it more commonly there, but it can be adapted to other contexts. And it's it encodes that in XML, right? So XML is wonderful for you know machine to machine interaction. It can be very precise. Um, it's not highly human readable. If we look at the actual XML file here, um, we'll see that it's it's rather large and it's got a lot of sort of embedded tags and code encoding and, and stuff. But this is where you let the machines take over and handle all of that for you. Um, so this is what DDI does for us. Um, and when you see DDI, you know, it's actually a, a very nice guarantee of some quality or thoughtfulness that people have put into formatting their variable descriptions. Um, and it just helps your life. DDI is good for you. Um, all right, so I've got a little optional information in the notes in the code here. If for whatever reason you were having issues, if you have issues uh, downloading and extracting your data and importing it, and you'd like to move, progress further, please contact me. Let me know. Um, I'd be happy to work with um, you know, students at Rutgers of, on that. If you just want to do a quick and dirty run through here, what you can do instead of uh, extracting the data from IPMs is you can use the files that, are, that would have come in the bundle that you downloaded from GitHub and use those smaller sample files. So if you, if you wanted to do that, you could uncomment the lines on 44 and 45 to load the sample data and then uh, reassign the data object to be this smaller sample data set. So you can see the original data, 8.7 million people, um, individual observations. Uh, the sample has only 100,000, so it's It'll be quicker, easier to manage on uh, slower or low memory systems, for example. There, there might be some other reasons you'd want to do that. I am not going to run those commands right now, though, because I'm working with the full data set. Uh, if you want to know how to create a smaller sample, 
sometimes this is really useful with large data sets is before you fully understand you know what's going on you don't want to run commands on a huge data set that going to generate memory issues it's going to um, take a long time to run each command and you want something to play with first until you really get that understanding you can you can just create a quick sample this is a, a um, tidyverse function sample underscore n and you say which original data set you'd like to work with and specify the number of observations that you're going to you're going to pull from that very quick nice way to, to do that um, again use this for exploration purposes but it's not super rigorous um, you certainly don't want to generalize about the full sample based on some little extract like, like this um, so I'm not endorsing this for you know final consumption um, and again in the directory there's a CSV version of this sample data file if you'd like to just work with that all right so we have if, if all you're interested in is is how to import the data you can actually stop the video now um, but the rest of this video we are going to move on to basic analysis just you know we can see what's going on in this IPMS data um, what are some issues when you're working with this multi-year uh, data how can we deal with that uh, just to give you a feel so I'm gonna again use my tidyverse approach I'm gonna load the tidyverse on line 60 I'm gonna be very lazy and attach the data um, so that I can use short variable names and you're gonna see that I'm I'm gonna be a little sloppy in terms of memory management uh, coming up uh, something you might want to just be aware of if you really are, are gonna start working on not 8 million but 80 million observations um, don't copy this method exactly I'll point out where we get into issues a bit later all right so let's just make sure we we have uh, what we think our data is uh, is let's let's make sure we understand it so I'm just doing a summary of the year variable uh, by the way the names of the variables which I can access by saying names data are the same as we saw in the data selection process they are these you know reasonably understandable but concise variable names in all caps um, and I think I was uncertain uh, expressed some uncertainty about that in the previous video but the D in this variable list stands for detailed right so there's a race coding and there's a race D which is detailed race that may have more you know the the, the main variable for race is following the IPMS principle of trying to collapse things into as many into as few uh, consistent over time categories as possible to make our analysis easier but sometimes you want to go back and check whether there's more information than that so they also provide you with the detailed race the detailed Hispanic origin um, detailed ancestry detailed language detailed education so we have those in the data as a kind of backup I'm not going to use them in this demo but they are there all right so when we that was an aside to explain how did I know to type year well I can check my my data set for the variable names so the year starts in 1870 the median is 1970 uh, and the latest data is from 2019 okay that that looks nice that looks um, like what we expected uh, let's just run a quick table on that data so we table of year uh, we can find out that in 1870 there are 383,000 observations in this data set. I believe that's a 1% sample, right? So that means that there were 38 million um, census records. I, I'm not, I'd have to go back and look at um, you know, what was the actual population figure recorded for the US at that time. Uh, but at least this sample has 383,000 records again you never want to sort of generalize from those quickly without understanding the underlying information there might be some 
missing data, some other issues. Um, 1920, we have just over a million entries. 1970, just over 4 million. And 2019, which is also a 1% sample, we have 3.2 million. That's, that's, a, that's about right, right? The, the current population of the U.S., uh, I can go on the census site and look it up, but um, why don't I just do that just f just for the fun of it? Um, because to use this kind of data, you have to um, be the kind of person who thinks that looking up these numbers is fun. Uh, current 2021 population, 328 million. Um, sourced from the 2019 population estimates, so we're pretty close to that, right? That's a reasonable um, number. Um, so, you know, this all looks good, makes sense. It looks like we, we read in the correct number of observations. The, the ch rate of change over time looks right. This would give us confidence uh, without scanning through the entire data frame that we, we've we got it right. Um, again, a check you always want to uh, make you know understand that your data did get imported correctly. Um, so now I'm going to do a little aside on the IPMS R package at this point uh, because I want to talk about this value labels um, issue. Right. So there is a thing in R called vignettes. Uh, many packages have these. A sort of more descriptive um, guides to topics uh, in addition to just you know the pure R documentation um, what was my um, well let me look at that that command ipums val labels right so if you remember, we have the, the help for each command, which gives us a very structured piece of information on an individual command and how to use it. But the vignette is a more expansive um, description. So this vignette on the issue of value labels talks about what happens when you bring in the value, variable labels. Um, and variable labels are brought in. We're going to see how to access them in a moment. But as this, I, I'm not going to go down that digression, but this document explains, um, you know, it's not all strawberries and cream or a bed of roses or whatever metaphor you'd like to use. Uh, there are a lot of details that don't quite come through um, easily. Especially, you know, you, we're still dealing with very complex data over many years. And you may, when you're really buckling down to work on your project, want to do some cleanup on the labels to make them consistent according to your own um, guidelines. And so this document discusses that, how you can check things, how you can recode things. And there are several label related functions that are um, adding labels, collapsing labels, um, things like that that you can work with. So that's all very good to know about. Um, when you're ready for that, you can run line 67 to access this vignette and read all about it. Uh, but while I'm talking about that, I'm going to go to the uh, site that I've linked for you in the description um, on the GitHub page. Uh, just the introduction to this package, the IPMS R package. So this introduction uh, will remind you of the steps to download and import things. It will talk about the extract functions. We're, we're only looking at IPMS USA, so we're only looking at IPMS Micro right now, um, which sometimes you also might want to use the other format of importing the data in a list format for data that's structured a bit differently. But as you can see, there are um, import functions for the G GIS data and for several other sort of variants there. Um, so this is a nice guide to look at. And in addition to that value labels vignette, there are vignettes on 
the geo components on the current population survey, you know, other th useful things as you dig in to using IPOMS. Okay, end of digression. Let's go back to our analysis. Um, so, you know, I have a variable here called sex, right? If I want to do something very basic like table of sex, I can find that across the entire data that I've sampled uh, or that I've extracted, I have 4.29 million ones and 4.44 million twos, right? So that raises the question, well, who's a one, who's a two, right? These are obviously male and female, but how do we how do we check that? Um, you know, there are other ways to sort of dig around, but the, I think the most straightforward way is in line 70, is to use the label retrieval function in the IPMS package and ask for the labels for that variable. So here, a one is a male, a two is a female, right? So this enables us to understand the data that's being presented. Uh, we've already looked at the names function in 72, so I'm going to do something else. Like here's 74. Here's a histogram of age across all the data that we retrie retrieved. So we can see that there's um, this sort of very, I, I would call it relatively steep sort of falling off function of um, many more young children, middle uh, aged people, and very few old people. Now, what's the problem with this, right? The problem is that we have pulled data for four different eras, really, that are that are 50 years apart, and each era has a different number of elements in the sample, so they're really not comparable. This is I, I shouldn't rely too much on a view like this that lumps all those years together. So when we're wor working with multi-year data, we are going to have to um, use that data structure. And I'm just going to illustrate some things. These are by no means the only techniques that you can use, but I'm using that tidyverse style coding uh, to take my data in line 78, group it by year, and then apply my function of, you know, something that I'd like to know about the data, um, apply it after grouping it so that the results will be reported by those groups. So let's take a look at what lines 77 through 79 give us. You notice that's a pretty quick computation for 8.7 million observations. Um, I asked for the mean of age. So we can actually see that in 1870, the mean age was 23.5, pretty young. Uh, by 1920, we've already seen a four year increase in mean age. Um, and presumably these are the results of, you know, long-term trends, greater health, longer life expectancy, lowering birth rates, pushing that mean up. Um, 1970, 31.8, you know, that's a sort of middle baby boom period. Um, that number, 31.8, if you compared it to countries in 2021, would be, you know, a number of a associated with the very rapidly developing country with a very young age profile by modern standards. Uh, it's interesting that that was the U.S. mean in 1970, um, and that's up to 42.2 in the 2019 sample. Now, we can go a little further and start to try to plot this data. So I'm going to run some ggplot commands. Um, this is all very quick and dirty sort of coding. I'm not um, cleaning up these views or you know labeling them or uh, doing too much with them. So with that caution, uh, we can see here's our histogram of age, but broken down by the year group, right? So we can we can visually see those very small number of 1870 observations. Um, we can see the baby boom here in 1970. We can see that lump right in the, the low age. And by 2019, we can see that the age profile has spread out quite a lot with a baby baby boomer bulge um, 
up in that 50 to 70 year old range um, that's still higher than younger generations there. So, you know, having access to the data, obviously the mean age is something we could look up in census publications. We can probably find that relatively easy, easily. But the advantage of having the microdata at the individual level is we can go straight in here and uh, slice it and dice it as we like. You know, our research questions guide where we're going. In this demo, I'm not even going to go into you know regressions or trying to establish causality um, or doing any major time series analysis, but you can think about that those applications as well. So you know you simply can't do regression on aggregate data, whereas here you can. Uh, just to show you another little refinement, rather than than looking at those blocky histograms, we can project a density estimate of population that maybe shows those trends a bit more clearly, we can see the clear baby bump of the baby boomers in 1970 and in 2019 still persistent in roughly the same shape, uh, just pushed 50 years down, down the road from peaking at around 10 to peaking at around 60. Right, looks, so that makes perfect sense there. Um, we're going to just kind of skim through some of these variables just to give you a flavor. So let me move on to race. Um, race, when I look at a table of race, I can see that there are nine um, elements that race has been coded into. Uh, 7.3 million of them are race number one and 907,000 of them are race number two, with the other numbers being substantially lower um, across this data set. This is, again, we're lumping together all the years. Uh, so, and I neglected to include this in the code itself. I'll go ahead and make that edit. Um, if I want to know what uh, those codes are. I'll run that val labels command, and I can see that one is white, two black or African American, um, and it you know it will. This is, again is the combined category for all of the historical data. So you'll see some um, retroactive terminology that you know as things were labeled in the past. Uh, three American Indian or Alaska Native four Chinese, five Japanese, six other Pacific, right? So we can see that even though we um, we have this table with uh, four, five, six, um, each of which has its own sort of, not enormous, but substantial number, um, if we were looking at a combined Asian category, um, of course, the census uh, treats each Asian nation as a separate race is one of the the ways that the the census classification is set up. Um, so you would have to manually think about. And this is where understanding your data comes in. Think about what are you trying to get at? Are you trying to get at all Asian groups? Um, and then you'd have to start combining some of the data yourself. You know, adding together columns to create a, a new variable that's going to represent what you're interested in. Um, what I'm going to do just for simplicity is to focus on um, white versus versus black, white and black population, the major dynamic of much of American history. Um, and I'm going to code uh, this data uh, the other thing that I, I have neglected to, to fix up this code, I'm going to fix up this code and upload it uh, to the um, to the uh, GitHub site based on these edits. So 
let's notice one other thing about race is that we can actually compute a mean of race um, because the way these have been entered is they're just numbers, right? So there is, that's a number one, a number two. Um, but in this case, the mean of race is, is not any kind of precise scientific measure, although we can see that when the mean goes to 1.81, that certainly is suggestive that in 2019, there are many more of the non-white uh, groups present. So uh, I want to make sure that it's treating race um, as a, a categorical variable. So I'm going to recode um, a second variable called race2 um, as a factor. That's what's going on in line 92. Uh, to make sure that I have access to that new data element, I'm going to reattach the data. Um, and I'm going to get this warning every time I do another attachment that the previous stuff has been covered up. It's masked by the new attachment. And so now I can do something like 96 and I can generate a graph that shows me, we're looking again at the age density, the age distribution um, for, and again, I'm gonna enlarge this a bit so we can see it a bit better. Um, for each of the groups. So in, in 1870, there were only four groups reported. Um, white is the sort of reddish line. Uh, the yellowy mustard, mustardy color um, is the black or African-American population. You can see that it, it peaks a little bit earlier. You know, the, there's a more young people and less old people by a slight margin throughout that distribution. Um, three was, uh, what was three? Three was a American Indian and Alaska Native. Now this is not a, a total, um, this doesn't represent the magnitude of the population, but it represents the age distribution. So similar pattern we see for American Indians, although um, 1870 less youth, right? So that may be an indication of you know diminishing population, and then we have this funky uh, spike for for number four. Um, that is the Chinese population, right? So that's uh, re reflective of you know the first wave of immigrants coming to work. Um, not so many children, not so many old people. Big spike around age 25-ish or so. And we can see those patterns change over time. Now this is a bit busy, um, although we, we can notice in 2019, right, these bright pink colors are for the two major races or three or more major races. So that, you know, those are, are newly available in recent census, the ability to mark multiple races. And those who mark that as their census option um, much more likely to be young children, you know, chil under age um, 12 and a half or so on this on this chart. Okay, but these are a little bit busy. So what I'm going to do is um, filter the data for just black and white. And so that this would be a technique you might want to use with some of your variables to just apply the, the tidyverse filter function, the dplyr filter function, and I'm going to say race less than three. I'm actually taking advantage of the numerical aspect of it here because I just want one and two. Um, I could use other syntax to do that. but So now I have a second data set, and this is where I said earlier that I was going to be sloppy in how I uh, presented things. So in how I manage my memory, right? I've created now a second copy that's a big giant 8 million observation data set. Um, I'm not worried about running out of memory on this computer, so I'm just doing it that way. But uh, be aware that whenever you create these extracts or copies, you know, you're multiplying your memory requirements. Um, and that could become an issue 
as your data your data could get large enough with these ipums ex extracts that that's that could be a problem i'm going to stick to data for my full data set and i'm going to repeatedly use data 2 through the rest of the code whenever i filter for something special um, now i want to attach data 2 so i can easily refer to the filtered version and now i'm just going to run that same uh, plot and you can see now I just have white versus black population density curves. And we can see, too, the, the, the bluish uh, color is the, the African-American group. And they pretty much all peak earlier and then start to go under the white line as age increases. So there are fewer old, older African-Americans. Um, 2019, we see that spreading out of the population away from a child-centered uh, distribution for both groups. And so hard to really say that much has changed, though, in terms of the life expectancy differences. So now we can, um, just to follow up on that in line 110, uh, we can run the mean age calculation just for these two groups and group the data by year and by race, right? So we can actually see the difference in mean life expectancy, not life expectancy, excuse me, but mean age at the time. Uh, in 1870, about a two-year difference. In 1920, closing in on a three-year difference. In 1970, um, that's almost a five-year difference in mean age, which has closed back up to about 3.5 in 2019. Um, I think another population issue you'll find is the white population or, the, or any um, wealthier population tends to have its uh, birth rates decline faster. The mean age gets pushed, pushed up quicker. So we're probably seeing some of that effect. That'd be my guess, not a population expert uh, with whites. Um, here. So again, another example of slicing and dicing the data. Um, if we look at, uh, I'm just going to flip back to our full data set and recognize that we could do this for every racial group that's identified. Um, even though in the tidyverse tibble format, it's not going to display all of them at once. We, we can do that. And we can see actually, okay, here's the Chinese mean age 30.1, 1920 Chinese mean age 37.5, right? Because the very sort of skewed immigration pattern without a lot of youth in place uh, in the country. All right, so that's all I'm gonna say about race. Uh, I wanna just, again, get you familiar with the, the variables themselves on a basic level. So let's look at education. Um, how is education coded? Education is coded uh, with, again, a numeric value. Here, the numeric value and a sort of linear scale makes sense because we're really talking about an approximation of years of schooling. Um, even though it's not quite linear, we have uh, those who have completed essentially middle school education coded as a two, primary education coded as a one, and zero is either missing or no schooling. That's a distinction to be aware of, right? But it's probably reasonable to say, if, you know, if someone didn't report their education level, it may be safer to assume that there was no schooling than to say, oh, they must have completed high school if they didn't answer the question. Um, that to me seems like reasonable, and it it's a case where we could just look at sticking with the numeric val value without having to do fancy recoding. All right, so let's look at uh, changes over time. And now uh, this was one of the variables that we didn't have data in 1870 and in 1920, right? So again, you always have to keep in mind that data structure that we, in this case, only have 1970 and 2019 data to compare. We can see that the mean went up dramatically um, with the mean now being a little bit higher than grade 12, um, so that a lot of post-secondary education in the mix. 
uh, not so much in 1970 among all all adults right who were sampled not we're not talking about people graduating in 1970. Uh, I'm not going to dwell on education let's move on to income at 126. Uh, let's look at the labels there. Uh, here's another interesting one so this is something to be aware of these are the labels for income right so income either gets reported as a numeric value but this is a case where some of the numeric coding um, was used for sort of qualitative indicators so I don't know what this negative 9995 is that's very strange uh, it seems like almost a miscoding of the number 9900 but it appears to affect only 1980 data so that's not in our data set so we don't we, we um, I'm choosing to ignore that. I mean, obviously, it, it is uh, somewhere in the label labeling for our data set, um, given that it's here. But I'm not so worried about that. Um, I'm not worried about these small numbers that negative one is used to represent a net loss. Um, I'm not worried about assuming a zero income for when there is nothing reported. Um, the no income and if someone only reports that they broke even um, they've been labeled as a one again that seems reasonable we can't assume that they made a lot of money uh, when they said that they broke even um, but this one is a big problem so here the missing data has been coded as nine million 999,999. So almost one billion dollars. <laughs> and we, we can see that in practice here. So if I actually ask for the mean income in the United States, in 1970 the mean income was 2.7 million dollars. And in 2019 the mean income was almost 1.7 million dollars. Now, again, you should be able to look at those numbers and say that's preposterous, something is going wrong. Um, but again, got to understand your data. Uh, so we, we can pretty much figure out from the, the labels that it's this missing data that's getting in the way. The missing data is actually throwing into the mix these very high numbers that are wildly inflating the reported income. And we got to get rid of that. So the way to get rid of that is on line 133. We use this na if function to recode uh, this variable, inc tote for total income. For that variable, whenever we see a 9,999,999 entry, or 1 billion minus 1, might be easier to say. When we see that, that's going to be coded as a true na that R will recognize. Uh, and we overwrite our, our data. So 133 is going to fix our problem. When we check our mean income again, we've now taken a substantial step to fixing that. So mean income in 2019, 45,000. Uh, mean income in 1970, 4,000. Um, it's probably about right, although it's, again, a little bit surprising to see... Um, Inflation has an effect. Some income growth has an effect there, um, but it, that, the number looks small. But I, I believe that's a, that's probably about correct. Four thousand one hundred ninety-six. Um, so that's an example of you know working to to recode and improve the the accuracy of the results that we see. All right, so we have just a few more. Now we're going to look at some things that have quite a lot of labels, right? So we, we're in a different situation uh, here. And I'm going to look at Ancestry. Uh, I should mention that uh, when I did the data extract for video four, um, I did it slightly differently. Um, I think I didn't include some of these variables like uh, Ancestry and Language. But it's not a, it shouldn't concern you too much. I mean, there, 
these are the similar sort of background variables that I was trying to choose. Uh, it turns out when I did this particular extract, I just did it a little bit differently. All right, so what are the labels for Ancestry? Um, okay, we print out the first 10, and they are various, you know, pretty specific European um, locations. Tyrolean, right? Not just Austrian, but Tyrolean, not just Basque, but French Basque. Uh, Flemish and Walloon, obviously you have to distinguish between those. Um, and 479 more. Okay, so if I'm interested in one particular ethnicity or ancestry, uh, I need to see those 479 rows. I can go to the IPUMS site and um, I, I thought I had included a link in here as well, but I can go to the IPUMS site and look for specific uh, data. Let's take a moment to do that. So here we are on the IPUM site. We go to support, documentation, um, and I believe we need to, easiest way to do it will be to browse the data itself. So we browse the data. Um, let's go to Wraith's race, ethnicity, and nativity, Ancestry 1, and we click on Ancestry 1, we, we are going to be taken to the descriptive page for that, uh, which explains how it's been created, how it's been harmonized, and the codes are all going to be listed here. Right. So now we can see all the codes in one place. We have the added advantage of being able to see which years uh, things are available for. So notice that in 1980, the Italy was broken into, you know, basically all the provinces. You could get province level information. Um, some of those categories have been collapsed over time. Um, others have been expanded. Um, so to account for, you know, finer grain definitions of, of ancestry and ethnicity, as, we, as we're going to see, is similar to this. Language is similar to this, related to this. Um, so these are all of those potential codes. So that, there's actually uh, nearly a 1,000. Um, in our particular sample, there are only 479 represented. Uh, so if we didn't want to go to the site, we could also do something like this in line 143. We could ask that the Tibble format be printed as a data frame. We say as data frame, and then inside that command, the labels command. And this will force it to print everything on the screen. So we could scan through and, and select. In this case, I'm going to select for Russian ethnicity. Um, and it turns out Russian is line is coded as 122 among other sort of Eastern European groupings. And so I simply run that same kind of filter command, but say filter for Ancestry 1. Ancestry 1, by the way, is the uh, first ancestry reported. So people can actually report multiple ancestries. You know, their father was Russian, their mother was uh, Chinese or, you know. But just for illustration purposes, Ancestry 1. Um, now we have this, my filtered data, data 2, has shrunk down to only 223 observations, right? So this is where, again, I would caution you, you can't generalize too much based on that. Um, it would probably make more sense to filter for ancestries that have a larger population. But across all four um, eras, uh, we have only 122 uh, I'm going to attach the data to make sure we are viewing the filter data. Here's our table. Our table shows there's only that one ancestry, 223 observations of code 122. Um, the race breakdown for this group, the Russian ancestry group, is 142 white and actually um, a sizable number reporting other groups or multiracial. Um, so that's interesting. 
Um, and just to show you our previous sort of, this is our age distribution plot, but only for the Russian ancestry group. Uh, now we can find out actually from looking at this that it's only in 2019 that we have any observations. So they weren't, I don't think they were asking about Russian ancestry in 1870. Um, 1970, uh, it's probably lumped under the Soviet Union. Um, so therefore, we realize we're only looking at 2019 observations. Um, and this is a sort of a high stable, a lot of older population up to age 60-ish. Um, not so many older people. So that's just to point out, you know, that we can run the same kind of analysis on, you know, any, any small slice of the data we'd like to, as long as we keep in mind that a very small slice, you know, it's a sample of a 1% sample and becomes increasingly likely to not be representative of the population as a whole as you get smaller. Um, language is really quite similar. Um, not as many observations, uh, about just under 100 languages reported. And we could go in and look at them all and look up Russian in this list. Um, filter for Russian, which happens to be code 18. And now we find there's actually nearly 9,000 observations. So instead of 222, um, there are almost 9,000 uh, who report Russian language speech. So we can kind of guess here that um, we're probably picking up earlier time periods. Um, a lot of people who speak Russian might be reporting their ancestry as countries of the former Soviet Union or uh, have been in the United States for a long time, but um, still speak Russian, right? There are a lot of reasons that we could adduce for that. Uh, but it turns out actually that um, this is still only 2019 data. So the, the, the language data is not as complete, again, as you'd, you might think. Um, the age distribution of the Russian speakers is much more skewed to elderly people, right? Which again makes sense. You might have some people with Russian parents, Russian ancestry, who are in this country no longer speaking Russian, who show up in that other group. Um, and you notice also the racial group is, um, in terms of percentages, not so ne nearly so multiracial as the Russian ancestry group. Um, anyway, we're just running through um, a, a quick run through, so I, I'm not going to, again, attach great significance to, to what that means. Uh, and now we're, we're on to our final uh, example. Um, variables in the category of labor and work. So labor force, occupation, and the occupational scoring um, element that I, I mentioned that in one of the earlier videos. Uh, let's go back to our full data set. Attach data on line 171. The labor force variable is one that's available across many years, and it's pretty simple, right? It's just either there's not reported, or a one if they're not in the labor force, and a two if they are in the labor force. So, and someone can be in the labor force and unemployed, by the way. So if I'm looking for work, I want to work, I'm in the labor force, even if I don't have a job at the moment. Um, only those who are, who are retired, don't want to work out of the out of the labor force. And of course, women at home caring for children who are not working are in that, that category reported as not in the labor force um, because that kind of labor force is defined as external uh, to the home. All right, let's look at the um, something that doesn't quite make sense, right? This is our mean calculation that we've been running. Uh, we can see that the mean reported number has changed over time. Um, but in this case, again, it's kind of linear. I mean, we don't want to attach great significance to this, but over time, the mean gets 
higher, which probably means that our proportion of people in the labor force is increasing. Um, we'd have to account more properly for the NA missing data and stuff to, to do this a bit better, which we can start by on the track to do that by looking at a table of the labor force. And so kind of ignoring column zero, which are the NAs, again, you'd really want to look into it to, to ask yourself why were a million people unable to answer the question of whether they were in the labor force or not at that time. You know, maybe all children under age 18 were simply not reported. Um, anyway, it's, that's a subject for investigation. But just looking at the one versus the two, just the sort of proportion, we can see there's a little bit more than half in the labor force in 1870. That proportion increases in, by 1920 hasn't changed too much proportionally by 19, in 1970, but certainly has, uh, by 2019, we've got essentially a 1.6 to 1 ratio of in the labor force versus not in the labor force. And again, to be more precise, you know, you'd want to start computing those percentages for real rather than just estimating them. Um, and another question we might have is what's what's the change in women in the workforce? So we can split our table into components by sex in line 181 just by adding sex as a third variable. In this case, we have um, two t reported tables. So uh, sex one, again, are males. We can see that the comparing columns one and two, that only about 10% of males reported not being in the labor force in 1870 and in 1920. That number starts to increase uh, in 1970, uh, 2019, when people actually start to enjoy actual retirement rather than working until they drop, um, which I think was much more likely in 1870. Uh, but still, the you know, almost double. Uh, almost a two-thirds proportion men in the labor force versus not. Uh, the numbers for women are quite different. Uh, very few, relatively speaking, in the labor force in 1870. That number starts to gradually go up. Um, but in 1970, there were still more women not in the labor force than working. And by 2019, we, we have more women in the labor force than outside. Now these are not great earth-shattering insights, but I, I, I just hope you get the feel of having the data itself at your fingertips um, enables you to just directly, you know, run the command, ask the question, uh, see what you can find out in your own terms. And that's the important thing about having access to this data. Now we're going to look at the occupational code. Um, the occupational codes are a little bit complex. Uh, this is one where um, codes from different decades have been mapped onto like this common scheme. Um, and it's hard to tease them out from the data file itself. Um, this is another case where you're going to want to go to the, um, the, the site itself. And if you go to variables OCC, um, you'll be able to access these codes directly and you can click in. It's like if I, I'm, I decided to use the most recent occupational codes and I can go in here and they're, they're quite fine grained. Uh, I can go in and look for very specific pr professions. So I looked up the number for librarians, uh, which is two, four, three, five. And I said, let me filter this data for librarians. Um, that is 2,835 observations uh, in the 2019 sample. And if this, this, this graph, uh, we're, we're looking at the same age graph that we've been looking at for this graph is a bit depressing because it shows that uh, librarians in general are pretty old. Um, 
obviously people retire and then they no longer report their occupation but the peak age of librarians is over 60 um, and the number of librarians under 40 pretty pretty small um, it is a graying profession um, and so you know take that as you will our final variable that we're going to look at is the occupational score that I mentioned in earlier videos. Um, the occupational score is, refreshing your memory, is an, a synthetic or you know um, research created proxy for the um, level of prestige and income of a particular profession. So we can go back to 1920, and we can we don't know the reported income of people, but we might have their profession, their occupation recorded, and we could use that as some kind of proxy of where they stand on the socioeconomic spectrum. The OCC score is one effort to do that. Uh, once again, there is um, uh, quite a lot of uh, debate over the proper use of these not a settled area by any means uh, but if you if you look up the documentation um, you'll find links to um, how you may want to think about that they're certainly here but the, the codes again are fairly detailed um, based on OCC 50 um, and so when we run these codes uh, when we run the labels, we find that there's actually only two sort of added labels. Uh, the top code, meaning the top end of the spectrum, um, 79 and 80, are like the maxed out levels of this score. Uh, when we look at the librarian's score, um, we find that they all score 22, right? That librarianship was given a 22 score. If we take a look at the full data set, we can see the other scores come into play and we can sort of see the distribution. Um, aside from these top coded ones, 63 was the highest, 4,842 individuals in the sample fall into that. You can see there's this broad sort of middle class, 333,000 score 22 similar numbers for 23 24 25 those are probably middle class occupations um, relatively small numbers for these low ones and then there's actually four million who are have a zero score so you again want to look into that um, the unreported it, it it may be difficult to make strong assumptions about the people reporting zero there because we just don't know much about them. Um, so this graph of the librarians is a bit depressing. I want to end on a more colorful note. Uh, the final code um, on um, line 204, we have gone back. These are the librarians again. Um, and the librarian age distribution by race. So this, this is quite different. Um, the sort of orangey line here are the is the white population, which has that over 60 peak. Um, other groups also have a sort of high age peak, but you can see again those multiracial groups uh, are much younger, sort of the new wave of uh, in, in this case, librarianship. Uh, relatively relatively different so that that graph is a little more uh, colorful a little less depressing than showing that all librarians are very aged uh, so we'll end with this example and i hope that this series has been useful to you i would encourage you if you have any questions um, or any any data related questions not just ipums uh, to reach out to me uh, when you dig into IPM's data particularly though remember that that organization they are the experts they offer detailed assistance you can contact them 
Um, they also have a number of really nice uh, video tutorials, online exercises, online guides for work with this data. So I hope this has given you a good introduction. Um, I hope you'll come back for more of the IPM series. We, we are going to also talk about IPM's International for international census data. Uh, and my colleague at Rutgers, Sue Oldenburg, is going to be presenting on the GIS aspects of IPM's data. So, um, which also are really spectacular for, you know, multi-year comparisons. Um, so I hope you enjoy IPMs, enjoy data, and thanks for your attention.